So with no further ado, I would like to tell you how the program of the session is going to go and what we're going to be doing. Uh, we'll start with um, a video that will introduce the SDGs. I hope everyone here has heard of them. If you haven't, this is your one last chance to know what they are because we're going to talk about how, as young people, we can actually achieve them and get to the goals that we've set. Uh, following that, we're going to ha we have three young entrepreneurs, um, amazing entrepreneurs, who are going to tell us about their initiatives and how they're working to support um, our goals of getting to the SDGs. Um, and then following that, we'll have a round, discussion, a round table discussion with um, the UNDP and UNICEF policy experts, um, as well as the three young entrepreneurs. So let me first introduce the, our panelists for today, and then we'll continue. So our three young entrepreneurs, um, the first one is, um, I'll start with the first one, Reynolds Butari. He is the owner of Green Express, a flower delivering company. He's also um, an author, and, most, and, and one other thing that is very interesting about him is the company he created, he created it from Burundi, and then when he was a refugee in Rwanda, he continued to expand his business. Um, the second one is Kem Dilim Owajebeko. She is the founder and managing director of Future Software Resources Limited. Her company is focused on providing digital marketing and technology solution for the scaling African enterprise as well as offer e-learning and IT consulting services. She is currently expanding her portfolio and recently co-founded three other um, tech startups. Our last entrepreneur is Nene Sisse. She's from Guinea-Conakry and the founder of and CEO of Albu Confiture. Albu is an agribusiness company that processes exotic fruits into jams. She also leads the Conakry Agri Makiti, a monthly agricultural fair, in order to promote Guinean agriculture. She is the recipient of Making Makers Matter executive training programs for the agribusiness, agri food sector. Nene is the member of MM Fellows Network and the Consoms Ghanaian Consortium. Um, and then our our next panelist is going to be Mr. Omar Abdi, the Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF. And last but not least, we'll have Mrs. Ahuna Eziakonwa, who is the UNDP Assistant Administra Administrator and Director of the Regional Bureau for Africa. So after this, we are going to hear amazing, uh, we're going to have an amazing conversation with our five panelists. So. Uh, just as a way of, of saying how this conversation is going to go, we are going to use um, Slido to ask our questions. Um, I'll ask our tech team to put the link and the code of the event on the screen so that everyone can uh, be able to access it. Uh, while our presenters are doing their presentations as well as doing our um, round table, you can be able to ask questions and we'll have them but also we'll try and mix it with um, a few questions from the audience directly. Um, so with no further ado, I would like to ask um, the first video of the SDGs. It's a song, so I hope you enjoy it. We are one world citizens, so that means if someone ain't living right, we all ain't living right. I am because we are. Ubuntu. Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. I won't go far without you. Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu. It's not about me, but the crew. Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu. Stick together like glue. Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu. Global goals, what it do? Without you, life don't make sense. We work 
can sow misery and can't be happy till we all free humanity one family so much money why do we have poverty that should be illegal so much food so why my people still hungry that should be illegal eternal happiness for you and you and you and you and you that's utopia but i know it will come true ubuntu 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 i won't go far without you ubuntu 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 it's not about me but the crew ubuntu 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 stick together like glue ubuntu 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 global goals what it do Culture. culture looking at us a wish for reduced inequalities i want to live in sustainable cities and communities if we have responsible production and consumption our future generation will be our fan climate action take care of life below water and life on land peace justice and strong institution will benefit us all if you need partnership for the global goals just give us a call Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu. I won't go far without you. Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu. It's not about me, but the crew. Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu. Stick together like glue. Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu. Global goals, what it do? I hope you enjoyed that um, and would like to ask everyone so that they can give us the link to the video so that tomorrow we can end, on Wednesday we can all be singing it at the closing ceremony, right? Um, so that song in particular is by a Rwandan singer, Jean-Paul Germain Bridge, and Germain Bridgewater, that the artist that you just saw. Um, so with no further ado, let me ask our first entrepreneur, Nene Sisi to come and tell us about um, Albu Confiture. Um, I'm going to speak in French, because <laughs> I'm more fluent. Um, donc, je suis uh, Madame Nene Sissé, la fondatrice et gérante de la société Albu Confiture. Uh, mon expérience en tant qu'entrepreneur uh, dans l'agriculture euh, ce qui m'a poussé à entreprendre, en fait, c'est lorsque je suis rentrée en Guinée, après la naissance de mon fils aîné. Donc, j'ai rencontré des difficultés à lui faire manger les produits du terroir, en l'occurrence les fruits et légumes. Et euh, avec la qualité de ce que je trouvais au marché, donc je n'étais pas tout à fait satisfaite. 
Et euh, quand je me suis approchée des vendeuses pour essayer de comprendre euh, la raison pour laquelle il était difficile d'avoir accès à des fruits frais et des légumes, donc elles m'ont fait comprendre qu'elles qu n'avaient pas de moyens de conservation. Et euh, vu que j'avais un peu fait l'étranger, enfin j'avais un peu vécu en France, j'avais toujours aimé les confitures. Donc euh, il était évident pour moi de, trans de, de transformer ces fruits en confitures pour pouvoir les lui faire goûter. Et euh, donc c'est une des principales raisons qui m'ont dirigée vers euh, l'entrepreneuriat. Le, Et partant du constat également qu'en Guinée, il était, euh, il était difficile pour la jeunesse euh, d'avoir accès à l'emploi, et qu'il y avait beaucoup de jeunes salariés, justement, qui étaient obligés d'avoir une activité supplémentaire génératrice de revenus. Donc, partant de tous ces constats, il m'a semblé évident qu'il fallait créer donc une, une, une activité génératrice de revenus et principalement d'emplois. Ensuite, les principales réalisations que nous avons eues depuis la création de la société Albou Confiture, je vais d'abord vous parler en fait de ce qui se passait en Guinée avant qu'il qu y ait eu la création d'Albu Confiture. Donc il existait beaucoup de coopératives de femmes euh, qui faisaient des confitures, qui essayaient de les commercialiser, mais elles avaient un problème en fait qui était lié à la gestion, à la gestion de, de leurs activités. Elles avaient un déficit, elles avaient un déficit de management, euh, donc elles étaient restées au stade artisanal, donc, euh, ce qui a fait qu'elles n'ont pas pu conquérir le marché local. Et lorsque nous avons décidé, un ami et moi, donc de, de démarrer, de faire de la fabrication et de vendre de la confiture, nous, nous avons à la fois utilisé l'expérience euh, que nous avions dans la gestion, ainsi que les, les technologies de l'information et de la communication, pour faire beaucoup de recherches, euh, essayer d'innover, changer, euh, créer quelque chose de nouveau qu'on n'avait toujours pas dans le, dans le pays. Et, euh, et cela donc, a, a été possible grâce euh, donc, aux réseaux sociaux et grâce au site de e-commerce. Euh, concernant notre, notre objectif, en fait, on, on s'est lancé dans cette activité dans, dans l'optique de, de contribuer à une alimentation plus saine et une certaine autosuffisance alimentaire. Ainsi, notre projet donc, consiste à l'implantation d'une unité de transformation euh, industrielle de fruits et légumes. Et, euh, donc, euh, on a pensé que cela pourrait contribuer, donc, euh, dans le cadre des SDGs, à la, à, la réduction, enfin, à la réduction de la pauvreté ainsi qu'à la création d'emplois pour les jeunes et aussi pour lutter contre la malnutrition euh, avec, une, avec la diversification alimentaire. Pour ce qui est de notre mission, donc, au quotidien, euh, à Albu Confiture, nous travaillons beaucoup à satisfaire les besoins de nos clients et en l'occurrence par la réduction du taux de sucre à hauteur de moins 25%. Et nous apportons ainsi à nos clients la qualité du terroir avec les exigences de certification internationale. Pour ce qui est de nos valeurs chez Albu Confiture, notre philosophie, c'est de grandir tous ensemble dans la dignité, euh, grâce au partage d'une volonté et d'une vision commune. Donc nous partons du principe que plus la société va grandir, plus nous allons évoluer avec nos collaborateurs. Pour ce qui est de, 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 de notre actualité aujourd'hui, Albu Confiture compte au moins une dizaine de salariés. Et euh, nous avons un savoir-faire régulier donc, qui est mis à jour au euh, contact régulier de personnes ressources avec, qui ont au moins une trentaine d'années d'expérience euh, pratique. Et grâce à notre réseau et à nos, enfin, nos participations à différents événements à l'étranger ou en Guinée, donc, nous avons su conquérir euh, plusieurs hôtels 5 étoiles ainsi que des supermarchés vendant des produits de qualité. Pour ce qui est de l'environnement des affaires en Guinée, donc, de nos jours, les start-up guinéennes bénéficient d'un cadre réglementaire favorable donc suite à la décision du gouvernement euh, d'encourager les jeunes diplômés à se prendre en charge et à éviter le chômage. Ainsi, la possibilité de bénéficier de certaines exonérations euh, fiscales euh, présentes dans le Code des investissements au niveau de l'Agence pour la promotion des investissements privés donc est un exemple qui illustre bien la, la mise en œuvre de cette volonté politique en Guinée. Concernant donc notre expérience, enfin mon expérience avec l'évolution de la société Albu Confiture, euh, la FAO, donc dans ses objectifs de soutenir les jeunes entrepreneurs, m'a invité euh, à un atelier de formation sur l'agri-business intitulé Making Market Matters à Nairobi en octobre 2017. Et à l'issue la, de la rencontre d'une trentaine de pays africains, donc j'ai bénéficié d'une seconde rencontre euh, cette fois-ci en Afrique du Sud en mai dernier. Et euh, donc, ça, à l'issue de cette rencontre en mai dernier, donc nous avons créé euh, un réseau qui s'appelle MMF Fellows. 
dont le, dont le but est de répliquer donc les stratégies et autres méthodes de marketing dans nos pays et sous régions respectives. Et donc, une fois de retour en Guinée, et toujours dans cette perspective de répliquer les, les méthodes vues ailleurs, donc nous avons initié une plateforme euh, qui s'appelle Conakry Agri Makiti, avec ma cousine entrepreneur. Euh, Makiti étant donc l'équivalent de, de marché dans plusieurs langues nationales en Guinée. Donc la raison d'être de cette plateforme est la promotion des produits euh, du terroir guinéen. Donc elle rassemble une, certaine, une centaine d'acteurs très dynamiques dans le secteur. Les principales actions menées par cette plateforme donc, sont l'amélioration de la visibilité et l'implication de la jeunesse guinéenne dans l'agriculture grâce à l'animation d'une foire agricole, la mise en place d'un réseau de jeunes agripreneurs guinéens pour promouvoir les échanges afin de capitaliser sur les expériences des uns et des autres, l'amélioration de la productivité et de la compétitivité du secteur privé par la mise en place d'un cadre organisationnel et opérationnel, la constitution d'un groupe d'influence pour défendre les positions de membres du réseau auprès des autres composantes socio-économiques, ainsi que la mise en place d'un pôle de création d'emplois pour les franges vulnérables de la population, notamment les jeunes et les femmes. Au-delà de toutes ces activités, nous, les jeunes millennials, sommes convaincus que le hub Yarps Connect Africa est une brillante perspective qui s'offre à nous pour que nos pays puissent bénéficier à la fois de l'expertise de nos anciens et de nos initiatives. Et, euh, mesdames et messieurs, je souhaiterais également que ceux et celles de ma génération euh, puissent voir euh, les obstacles que nous rencontrons de nos jours comme étant des, des éléments moteurs, étant, de les prendre comme, un, comme une source d'engagement pour pouvoir, euh, pouvoir franchir, euh, innover, créer, faire des choses nouvelles, parce que les, nos aînés ont déjà, ont déjà tant donné pour l'Afrique, ils ont déjà tant fait, donc c'est à nous de prendre le relais de nos jours, et j'espère pouvoir partager avec vous donc mon enthousiasme et mon optimisme dans cette optique-là. Thank you, Cissé. Um, as she said, um, as young people, we should see all the challenges we, we face as opportunities and not as hindrances to our development. Uh, our second um, presenter is Reynolds Wutari. Thank you. My name is Reynolds Wutari. I am a Burundian born. I live in Kigali as a refugee since April 2016. My life is of high and lows and high. So I'm going to start by the highs, meaning the life I was living in Burundi. It was that kind of life you would qualify as successful. I am a psychologist and I had something called Burundi Counseling Center. We would go on TV, radio, and try to help couples or people trying to soon get married. We were mainly heart doctors, and we had a lot of success. I had also a business. I had um, a printing company which was specializing into printing promotional items, meaning we will do USB keys and put uh, logos of uh, enterprise or NGOs and stuff like that. So with the 2015 crisis, I lost it all. I was rock bottom, meaning no enterprise or radio were burnt or TV, I mean the private TV. So I had to think of something to do in order to not die of poverty or hunger. So I started Green Express, flower delivery company. Why I started that? I, remem I remembered that during therapy session, people would still be in love, like each other, but they don't want to see each other personally, you know? Like, yeah, I love that person, but if, if she's just beside me, I would just scream at her, shout at her, or even beat her, but still I love her. So I was like, okay, let me do this flower delivery company so that those people who care for each other, they could send flowers to each other without actually meeting, 
you know. So before starting it, people were like, no, it's not going to work. It's not part of our culture. Uh, people don't send flowers in Africa. It's a white thing from the West, from TV. So either way, I did it because otherwise, you know, you die of hunger. I mean, you, you have no, no business. You have nothing to do. So I started the thing, and it was an online business company. It, and that, too, was a challenge. So I started, and it worked. But then the security situation continued to worsen. Then I had to move to Rwanda and come. So my plan, I had one plan. I had two cars, one big fancy car and one, uh, you know, usual car. My plan was just, let me sell these cars and start a new business in Rwanda. So when I arrived, I spent the first month just depressing drinking, calling friends, crying after the life in Burundi I lost, and whatever. So at one point, I told myself, I have to, this suffering has to stop, you know? Can I do something to worsen my situation? Or can I do something to make it better? All the answers were, yes, I can keep drinking and destroy my life, or I can, I can just start another business, the same I had in Burundi, and keep flowing, you know. So the car didn't sell. I had no money. Um, I was living on the money I got from Burundi, you know, from the sales of Green Express in Burundi. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do with no contact, no network, just start on scratch? So we did some Facebook ads. I went to RDB. Again, uh, the lady who was registering the company, she was uh, smiling at me like, you know, young man, flowers in Rwanda, Kigali, it's not gonna work. <laughs> but yeah, it was the same issue. I do it or I die, you know? So I, I just, I told her, you know, just write Green Express Africa and flower delivering company, yeah. We did, we did Facebook ad and the first time we did the Facebook ad, we got more order than the flower I have prepared to sell. It was just an instant success. People would just call, maybe they were testing, I don't know, but the first, the first Facebook ad, the first sales. Then we had, we would go on event and bring roses, you know, red roses to women, a white rose to the man, give a business card and tell them, you know, if you want to please her or if you want to say I'm sorry, you know, just in case, <laughs> call us. Yeah, so I am here to tell you that if I have made it here in Kigali as a refugee with no contact, with no network, with, you know, virtually nothing, because the car didn't sell at all, I told you. So maybe you can make it in Africa. Thank you, Reynolds. Thank you very much. So I hope you all live here with the website, right? We're all still young. I need flowers. <laughs> <laughs> um, our last presenter, or last entrepreneur, is Kem Dilim Wajebego. She's, as I said, a software engineer. Thank you very much. So I'm very excited that, you know, you talked about social media and, you know, how the power of digital actually gave you a chance. Um, when I started my company 10 years ago, it was with the vision to put African businesses on the map and give African businesses and business owners a voice. Right? Um, the journey has been very interesting from people chasing me out of their office saying, little girl, we've been making money before you were born, um, to now people saying, we need your services, please come and help me. Right? I think the story of every entrepreneur has ups and downs and ups and downs. <laughs> and you know, it's not an easy path to, to go and to decide, but it is worth it. 
It is worth it because you are able to, number one, manage your own time, right? It is fantastic because there are always people watching. There's been so many people, especially young girls, that have come up to me and said, because of you, I am now a software developer. Because of you, you know, I heard you speak somewhere or I follow you on social media and I like the work that you do. So, you know, being a role model is one of the things that is the duty of every single entrepreneur and, you know, part of the impact that entrepreneurs, you know, kind of bring to the table. Being an entrepreneur, especially in the technology space, has also allowed me to kind of see lots and lots of opportunities. So I've been able to create four additional businesses out of just being able to see the power of technology, right? And I think that for every entrepreneur, especially when you're in the B2B sector, you surround yourself with ideas, with people who are, you know, creating businesses, and you add value. And when you add value, a lot of the time, people will say, come on board, help us. You know, come and sit on the board, come and have some shares, come and take some equity. And these are opportunities that you will not get by having a nine to five job. My company has also had the privilege to actually very closely work in um, supporting the SDGs. And funny enough, we've been doing this since 2008 when it was the MDGs and not the SDGs. And um, how did we do this? So I went and I spoke at a conference and there was a professor there who had a network called the World Summit Youth Award. And, you know, he said, hey, you, you're from Nigeria, and, you know, like, I need somebody who can promote the network there. The network was all focused on using digital technology to implement MDG solutions, right? So, obviously, the network still exists. It is massive. It is global. Um, I am still on the board of that network and still very active in promoting that network. And the amount of solutions that I've seen that technology has created to solve problems, right? To make sure that there is gender equality, to provide quality education, to create innovation has just been absolutely mind-blowing and, you know, absolutely amazing. Um, recently, we also partnered with a UN initiative that is the um, most influential people of black descent, and they launched a, an initiative called TechSolves. TechSolves is focused on using technology to, for, um, to solve problems around SDGs. So I think for me, the you know, key thing is that as an entrepreneur, you get to do lots and lots of interesting things. You just have to be open to it, and you have to embrace the opportunities and actually just attract whatever you want to do. Um, it's a very, very challenging journey as well. And one of the things that um, you know, Esther asked was, what are the challenges? I would say challenges lie around, especially in technology, it's very male dominated. So a lot of the time I'm the youngest and I'm the only female in the room. I send emails and then when I get there, yeah, so where is Mr. and Kem? I'm like, well, there is no Mr. and Kem. This is Mrs. and Kem, and you know, like, I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> being, you know, in technology also allows you to actually um, connect with emerging technologies and really be at the forefront. However, what I've noticed is that in Africa, we're still very, very scared and Unfortunately, our governments also do not create enabling environments and policies that support emerging technologies. When we talk about cryptocurrency, blockchain, and those kind of technologies, there's still a lot of fear instead of openness. And I think that, you know, that's one of the areas that is really a big challenge. How do you get governments to create enabling environments for innovation? We don't need technology that's 10 years old in Africa. We need technology that is now and here, and we need to make sure that we build capacity for that technology. Um, and, and I think that, you know, part of it, the policies can create market readiness as well. If there were policies 
10 years ago when I started that businesses have to be online, it would have been much easier to get into the market, right? But the market wasn't ready. The market got ready five years after I started. Now technology is a buzzword, it's easy, you know, people come and find me. But at the beginning, it wasn't like that, simply because there were no enabling policies. So I think for me, the key challenges really lie around policy um, and and governments actually being able to understand the power that digital um, and technology has to transform this continent. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you, Thank you Kim. So um, I would like then to ask our other panelists to join us, Mrs. Ahuna and Mrs. Omar, Mr. Omar, to join us uh, to start this conversation. As they join us, I'd like to remind everyone that this is going to be a bilingual conversation. So please um, make sure that you have your translation devices so we can all be able to, to share this. So feel free to ask, let on ask questions in any language. We'll be able to, um, to answer them. So if I go ahead and, and start with you, Mrs. Ahuna, I'll piggyback on what Kim finished, saying that, uh, talking about environments, enabling environments. And um, if you look at a technology company like has 10 years ago when she started, there was no policy environment um, available for her to thrive. You look at what CC is doing, um, she's creating new industries that are not available that were not there in, in, in Guinea-Conakry. And if you look at Reynolds, um, as a refugee, he has even more um, obstacles to, uh, and challenges to, to really tackle. Um, what is the UN currently doing to support young people that are in these environments, strategies and programs to help them on that? Thank you. Um, I think I, I first want to remark on a few things um, based on, on these fantastic three entrepreneurial stories that we have heard. Um, the first one is I want to confess that I am a fan of the SDGs. <laughs> I, if you're not in the room, uh, let me ask your forgiveness, but I am a self-confessed fan of these SDGs for a number of reasons. One is that it's the first time actually we have a global platform that makes, that does not discriminate in terms of whether we're north, south, east or west. These are universal goals. The SDGs are as relevant to Sweden as they are to Somalia. And I think that they are an equalizer, that we all need to make some change somewhere to make our planet a better place. So first of all, not just something that's for developing countries as we, d we saw with the MDGs. The second one is that they are comprehensive. For the first time, I think we also have goals that touch on every element of our lives. It's not just about fighting poverty, it's also about inclusive justice, systems, inclusive governance. It's about recognizing the fundamental human rights of every individual and the underlying dignity with which all human beings should be treated. And I think that in itself, it's something that we should uphold and celebrate. The third one is that it's really about the future uh, of, our, of our planet and the future that all of you young people are going to walk into. Some people had said to me when the SDGs came about that, oh, but there is no SDG for the youth. And that was precisely the wrong question because we have now come beyond this idea of just marginalizing or putting youth on the sideline or as a subject. And as you've heard in this expression today, every young person has some relevance to these goals. The stories that we've heard are precisely about the SDGs. The youth are in the mainstream of the SDGs, not a sideshow. And so this is you know, really what I wanted to first emphasize. And that's why the UN is, is forcefully 
pursuing these SDGs. And in terms of how we are creating the right, come back to your question, environment for, I think Youth Connect is one of the uh, approaches that we're using here, that we are here today um, really putting a very strong tone of support for platforms like this that create opportunities for young people to be heard and to, to, to put their views on the table for policymakers uh, to make changes. So first, engagement. Uh, because if, if the leaders don't know where it's hurting, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult for them actually to make those changes. And you're wearing the shoes. You need to be able to, to articulate what it's important for you to be able to realize your full potential. So creating a platform for the engagement of youth voices is one way to get into the policy changes. I think the second uh, one, which I think is, crit is critical, is that we bring these solutions to the local levels, that through the UN's um, huge network in countries, we're able to uh, work with governments, and that's why you have seen the, the effort we've made also to facilitate the participation of governments here, uh, to bring uh, the relevant national institutions to hear the youth, to go back, to help them to put in place those policies, those strategies, and to integrate those into their national plans and to budget for them. Budgeting becomes very important because otherwise it's just talk and nobody can implement. This morning we heard about the importance of implementation. At the heart of that is the importance of budgeting. So influencing governments to actually put money to strategies and policies is the third one. And, and I think lastly, uh, a, a way that we are finding uh, very useful is to bring in private sector um, and create a platform, use the convening power of the UN to bring all partners together, whether they're NGOs, they're private sector, they're government, to have this sort of triangular relationship where we're seeing the role of each partner in increasing and widening the space uh, for youth engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come back to the private sector a bit later. Um, so I'll just want to continue the question to Mr. Omar, but more focus on the recently launched uh, Youth 2030 Agenda. That if you don't know about it, it um, it's a UN youth strategy to scale up global actions to meet young people's needs, realize their right, and tap their possibilities as agents of change. So as UNICEF, um, it was recently launched, but what are you kind, right now thinking about in terms of programs, strategies to put in place to reach that vision and that goal? And piggyback on what Mrs. Ahuna was talking about in terms of engagement of the young people and integrating them into the ecosystem. Thank, thank you, Esther. Um, let me begin by congratulating the young panelists here. I think their stories are inspiring. Um, and if there is one thing, if I were one of the young people here who would take from your stories is that while you're young, take risk and don't look opportunities far away. Opportunities are closer by. You can get it from the fruits around you, from the flowers around you, from what you know and you study it and immediately start um, um, a company. So I think um, in terms of the UN and the role that it can play and link it to the SDGs, I think uh, first of all, as Ahuna said, the SDGs provide the enabling environment that we were talking about, that, that all of you, you need infrastructure to be able to do your work, you need internet to do your work, um, you need the right policies. And I think the 17 commitments that your governments, all governments have done, um, and now the private sector is also embracing the SDGs, it's an opportunity um, to, to, to take it. Now, coming back to your question, Esther, um, Last month, um, when the Secretary General launched the um, Youth Strategy, UN Youth Strategy 2030, at the same time, he and 
uh, President Kagame launched a, gener a Generation Unlimited uh, partnership. Um, Generation Unlimited is a private public partnership that brings together um, all of the partners that are interested in addressing um, uh, issues of youth. And the objective is, or the goal is by 2030, every young person is either in a school, learning, training, or in employment. Um, and the focus is to um, establish a platform where everybody who has ideas and everyone who wants to support can come together. And Youth Connect is one of those um, that are actually one of the solutions that are being considered for investment. There are a number of um, governments that have already championing it. Um, in this um, continent, President Kagame I mentioned, President Ramaphosa, President Kenyatta, the new young Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, Prime Minister Abiy, they're all championing now this new um, um, uh, partnership of Generation Unlimited. Uh, we have a number of private sector and foundations, both from Africa and from elsewhere, that are also supporting. Um, so if you go online, Generation Unlimited, you will see, uh, you will get more information about it. And it will show you how the UN came together, brought together governments, private sector to support young people. Thank you, that is very informative. So um, to come back to our entrepreneurs, one of uh, my biggest question and uh, what Mrs. Aona was talking about, what do you think is your role as the private sector? Because I believe you are the private sector um, to achieve the SDGs. What do you think is the, well, your role? So I'll start with Nene. Donc, euh, en tant qu'entrepreneur, euh, en tant que jeune entrepreneur, je dirais tout court, euh, notre rôle euh, dans le cadre des ODD est très divers. Donc, le, déjà, il y a déjà cinq points que moi j'ai identifiés euh, à mon niveau. Après, peut-être qu'il y a d'autres choses. Euh, premièrement, donc, la lutte contre la pauvreté. Donc, euh, je pense qu'elle passe forcément par la création d'emplois. Et euh, je vais sauter quelques étapes. Euh, il y a aussi l'industrialisation, l'innovation et, et les, infra les infrastructures en Afrique. Donc, euh, industrialiser l'Afrique. Nous avons tellement de choses à faire. Nous sommes encore à l'état primaire, j'ai envie de dire, de beaucoup de sur beaucoup de choses. Nous importons nos matières premières. Nous ne les transformons pas. Nous ne donnons pas de la valeur à nos produits. Et euh, déjà, passer cette étape-là, faire une industrie dans la plupart de nos produits, de nos matières premières, pour en faire un produit fini, c'est déjà une grande étape pour la création d'emplois. Ensuite, euh, en Guinée, nous avons souvent, nous faisons face jusqu'à présent à un gaspillage en fait alimentaire pendant la saison des pluies, euh, la saison des pluies, la saison des mangues. Euh, lorsque c'est la saison des mangues, vous pouvez vous promener à l'intérieur du pays, vous verrez plein de mangues en fait qui pourrissent sur les bords, le, le bord des routes, parce que tout simplement, euh, on consomme. Et après la période, on en veut, mais il n'y en a plus. Parce qu'on ne pense pas à conserver, on ne pense pas à transformer euh, pour qu'on puisse en avoir tout au long de l'année. Ensuite, il y a donc juste, justement la transformation est une autre façon de pouvoir manger sainement, de pouvoir euh, lutter contre la malnutrition et, et la faim, je dirais. Donc, euh, en plus de cela, euh, avoir une bonne éducation, donc euh, l'éducation, donc euh, la base, avoir une bonne base d'éducation, c'est très important. Une population éduquée euh, comprendra plus facilement qu'est-ce qui est important pour elle, qu'est-ce qu'elle veut vraiment faire de sa vie et Qu'est-ce qu'elle pense être possible justement à son niveau et où est-ce qu'elle peut aller chercher de l'aide pour s'en sortir Ensuite, je parlerai également de, du fait d'avoir un travail décent et d'avoir des salaires corrects qui nous permettent de vivre euh, dignement euh, en famille. C'est très important parce que on a tendance souvent à penser qu'on est qu'en tant qu'entrepreneur, euh, l'entrepreneur s'enrichit, il oublie ses salariés. Mais c'est faux en fait. Euh, nous, chez nous, à Albu par exemple. Nous, nous évitons de dire que nous avons des salariés. On préfère dire des collaborateurs ou des collègues. Parce que nous sommes une force, en fait. Et le potentiel de, de, de nos collaborateurs reflète le travail que nous faisons. Donc, plus ces gens-là vont se sentir impliqués, concernés par ce qu'on qu fait, plus ils partageront notre vision, plus on évoluera ensemble et plus on va s'assurer qu'ils soient dans de meilleures conditions et forcément avoir de bons salaires. Donc c'est dans ce cadre-là que je pense qu'on se retrouve dans les SDGs, enfin les, les objectifs de développement durable. Thank you. And just to uh, to probe you further um, on the point of food security, where you say that in um, 
in the rainy season in Conakry, you find mangoes laying around, um, uh, having, so what do you think young people can do there? What is their role in, in, in addressing such challenges, especially on the food security point? Juste actuellement, donc, euh, dans le cadre de Conakry Agrimakiti, nous avons pu rencontrer beaucoup de jeunes donc, qui évoluent dans, dans le secteur agroalimentaire en Guinée. Il y en a beaucoup donc, qui font des, des produits séchés, d'autres qui, qui font de la pré-cuisson, enfin, qui emballent en fait. Mais euh, j'ai envie de dire, il y a la volonté qui est là. Les jeunes veulent faire des choses, ils veulent innover, ils veulent que ça change. Mais euh, ils ont des barrières qui sont principalement l'accès aux emballages. Nous n'avons pas beaucoup d'industries euh, où on peut aller se fournir en termes de bouteilles, en termes de, de sachets pour, faire des, pour avoir un beau packaging et pouvoir être concurrentiel au niveau des marchés, euh, des supermarchés. Donc nous avons tendance justement à consommer ce qui est importé beaucoup plus que ce qui est fait localement. Donc j'ai envie de dire, les, les jeunes ont la volonté, mais ce n'est pas toujours facile pour eux parce que le cadre n'est pas, pas spécialement favorable justement. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll continue asking this question around. And let me just go to Reynolds on exactly the same question. What do you think is your role as a young person um, in the private sector um, on the SDGs? Mainly, I think um, our role is to reduce poverty. Because like, since we were born, they tell us that Africa has a big potential, that Africa is most probably the richest potentially uh, continent in the whole world. So our goal is to actually execute that, with that potential, this potential which is said. So you may ask me how concretely you reduce poverty by, by paying taxes to the government and then they can build hospitals and uh, roads and stuff. You reduce poverty by uh, job creation. You also reduce poverty by giving back to the community. I mean, if you have got that much money, maybe you could build schools later. So for me, our role is to inspire those kids to not only wait on, on a job, on a government. You know, we have to, to show that the pattern has changed. In Africa, there used to be this pattern of you only grow or develop according to who you know, to what family you are from. So now they need to know that we are in a new digital world on where you only grow and develop according to your online reputation. If your company has a lot of likes, it will probably get a lot of clients. So our role is to get the population or people who follow us into, into this new era where there is no, in which family are you from? Uh, who, 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 who do you know? Uh, no one called me before you come, you know. So now it's, I saw you somewhere, I saw your picture somewhere, uh, I read your story, and then, peop then you inspire trust and people can buy your things. So I think this is our role. Pay tax, give back to the community, job creation, and awake people on the new trend, the digital trend, yeah. Thank you very much. I think that is very, very inspiring. Um, I'll also again ask the same question to Kim. Okay, so I th actually think that the role of entrepreneurs kind of spans across all of the SDGs. The SDGs address gaps and problems, right? Entrepreneurs create solutions. So whether it's in education, whether it's in industry and innovation, or it's about clean water and sanitation, what entrepreneurs bring to the table is basically solutions in these specific areas. Um, and whether you call yourself a social entrepreneur or you're just in it for the money, as long as you're solving a problem, you know, you are actually contributing to the SDGs. And I think it's very important that entrepreneurs actually understand this and are very intentional about doing that and also very intentional about delivering the message of what they're actually contributing, the problems that they're solving. The minute you um, communicate the problem that you're solving, whether it's, you know, making sure that, you know, mangoes don't, you know, waste, or whether it's um, delivering flowers, right? There is a gap. That's why he has a business. That's why she has a business. There is a gap. That's why I have a business. And the SDGs basically showcase all of these different gaps. So I personally see the SDGs as 
amazing, amazing opportunities for young people to key into. All you need to do is go through the SDGs and think about what kind of solution can I provide for each and every one of them. Choose one, build a business, and in 10 years we have a better Africa. Look at the SDGs, choose one, create a business, and in 10 years we have. I think that is going to be our conclusion at the end of this. But just to piggyback on this, on what they've, um, they're saying, uh, Ms. Omar, what do you think, how can we repackage the SDGs so that peop young people can actually look at them as investment opportunities? And in a larger scale, the new partnership that we're trying to, to create, um, CC was talking about uh, the lack of um, industries, the lack of uh, people who are processing raw material, who are helping them do packaging and all that kind of stuff. How do we repackage them as investment opportunities rather than uh, funding gaps that only UN agencies and uh, foundations and governments need to fully solve? How do we get to what she actually talked about? Yeah. It's a very good question. Um, one of the partnerships we are promoting now is shared value partnership, which is what basically in Kem and Nene and, and we're talking about and Reynolds, where businesses can make money, in their business can profit, but at the same time make value for society in general. Um, I would challenge Nene to think about producing infant nutrients now. It's in your line, your business, you know vegetables and, and fruits. If you could produce something for infant feeding, where you can make money and, and will be good um, for children. Um, in Kem, the same things you could do e-learning, um, where she could make money, and but at the same time educate uh, money Nigerian children. And I think Reynolds could, in his e-commerce platform, if you could even send some messages, educational messages for parents um, that relate to either how do they take care of their children it would be beneficial for society and you will make money as well. So I think in every business they could do value for society while also profiting. So uh, I'll ask again, follow up with Mrs. Aona on that question. Um, we, uh, yet we always read that Dangote needs 38 visas to go through Africa, um, which means he actually can't invest, how do we attract someone like him to invest in young people um, like Reynolds, like Kim, like Nini, and, and even get him to, to be excited about achieving this instead of thinking about it as, um, as just something that he's, uh, as CSR, as corporate social responsibility, more of as an investment opportunity. How do we get some people like that to think or oh, this is worth my time and my business? I think by getting you to talk to them. <laughs> it's, it's very important that we increase the face-to-face -face, uh, energy between what exists in this room and with the young entrepreneurs here who are leading the way, uh, with people like Dangote and, and others who are actually already moving into this circle. You've, you had Tony Elumelu here uh, last year for the summit. Uh, so you have more and more of uh, big business, small business, feeling this need to reconstruct their image. Because for the longest time, uh, business has been associated with inequality, with exploitation, uh, with uh, driving uh, the, the agenda for, for um, grabbing from, from the poor. And I think what we have found through the SDGs is that this is actually not very tasty for business, that business is increasingly wanting to be associated with value creation, with social impact. And which is why, I mean, we were quite surprised to see the uptake of the SDGs with private sector that private sector really wants this engagement with the SDGs. They have seen, yes, the, the business opportunity, and we had, um, uh, I, might, I must quote, quote this number because I myself was surprised by it. I think it's the Business uh, Sustainable Development Commission that estimates through a study that 
achieving the SDGs will unleash something like 12 trillion uh, US dollars to, in the market. You know, when you're looking at opportunities in health, education, cities, energy, I mean, it's like there is huge potential. One thing that we heard from Kim, uh, Nene, and uh, Ronald is that their invention or their entrepreneurship spirit was triggered by a need, either a need at a personal level or a need at a community level. I think Ronald used the expression, do or die. And that's what we've seen in the greatest inventions in the world. They came, they were born out of a pressing need that someone had. And in Africa today, we have so many needs, multiple needs that people are looking for solutions for. So imagine this to be a gold mine for anybody in business to actually begin to find the solutions while making money. Uh, at the same time, which is what is demonstrated here. And really to, to, to say this is, we're seeing this as a huge win-win uh, in, the, in the marketplace for business and for organizations like the UN that are trying to really ensure that we have equitable distribution of wealth. And I have to say, uh, Nene, I went to Guinea many years ago and I committed my first crime by smuggling a mango out of Guinea. It was the largest mango I've ever witnessed, <laughs> I've ever seen. It was so huge that I thought, this has to get out of Guinea and I want to tell the story of what is possible in this country. You know, where else do you find this mango this big? And yet at that time we were talking about charity, you know, like um, uh, humanitarian assistance to Guinea and I was, precisely trying to make the point that this isn't a country that requires uh, uh, aid as such if we could convert the incredible wealth, natural wealth of this country to the benefit of its people. Thank you, and I couldn't agree more. As, as someone who now interacts with um, researchers very often, one of the biggest idea is that the next big invention is going to come out of Africa. So why are we not taking advantage of that and being the actual inventor and innovator of, of our generation? So with my last question before we go to the q and I would like each one of you to really articulate one way in which a private and, and public partnership going to the last uh, SDG goal, the 17th SDG goal, what is the one way that public and private sector, as well as the civil society, can collaborate to achieve all these things that we are talking about. So anyone who wants to start. Okay, I'll go first. Um, so I think in terms of partnership, one of the things that's really important is policy making. Policy making cannot be one-sided. Um, if we look at education, for example, the private sector knows what they need, yet the public sector produces candidates and students that are not qualified for work in the private sector, and then you have a massive gap. Why can't we help shape the curriculum, help shape policies in our different sectors, right? And not only, oh, I'm a dangote, and you know, I have access to the president, and I can you know, talk to him and tell him, oh, I need this, 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 and this. No, how can I, as a small business owner, have a voice and make sure that I am able to actually say, these are the policies in my specific sector. And I think especially in the technology sector, because there's a huge age gap as well, and a huge disconnect in terms of the policy makers even understanding what the technology you know, allows you to do, the opportunities that technology brings, um, and the youth just saying, you know what, we don't need government, we're just going to do it. The truth is that you do need government, you do need regulation in order for you to scale to a certain um, level, which means that there has to be some kind of engagement, there has to be some kind of way of sitting around the table and you know, actually coming up with solutions and policies together. So I think to me this is really the biggest um, you know, aspect because without proper policy um, environment and without proper strategies around, you know, and for me this is specifically technology. I believe that every African country should have a national policy that is driven by technology. 
right? And for me, this is really, really key because we are in the fourth industrial revolution. It's not something that's in the future. It's something that has started now. And if we don't engage the youth that are actually working in that particular sector and looking at, okay, so what are you doing with this blockchain thing that I don't understand? What are you doing with this AI thing that I don't understand, right? And making sure that the policy environment actually enables innovation as opposed to stifling innovation. Because what's happening now, and I'll use Nigeria as an, an example, a lot of the policies that are making are being made in order to generate more revenue for the government by creating license fees for different sectors. For example, in insurance, if you run an insurance aggregator that is technology driven, you now, have to, you now need a license. That license costs a lot of money. Um, which means that new entrants can't actually come into that sector because if I need $25,000 just to pay my license fees and I've not actually developed my application, I am not actually going to start my business, right, as a young person. So why do these kind of policies exist? They exist because the government is looking at revenue generation. But what they don't understand, by creating these kind of policies, you're stifling innovation. And it's very important that we actually create enabling environments. And we can only create these enabling environments by actual public-private partnerships where we actually look at what does this enabling environment look like? You know, what are the policies? What are the kind of tax breaks that entrepreneurs need in order to really accelerate and really transform and scale businesses to businesses that are at a critical mass? Right? Because at the end of the day, my business can stay small if there's no enabling environment. Nenis' business can stay small. Yes, we'll be able to fend for ourselves and put our kids through school and you know, we'll have a good life. But how can we make sure that we can employ as many people as Dangote is employing, for example? How can we make sure that we are role models to the next generation and show them that, you know what, Africans can do it? This can only be done if we actually have some kind of partnership with government. Anyone else want to um, I will take from the other side. I think governments and intergovernmental organizations also need to understand and embrace private sector. There, is, there has been traditional skepticism. You think that private sector is always bad. They are after money, you know, they, they, they ruin. That's the traditional thing. I think it is slowly changing, but governments and intergovernmental organizations, including the UN, need to get to know private sector more and embrace. Of course, you need regulations. Um, that's part of life. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to understand each other in order to partner. Definitely. Thank you. So I would like to, you want to take a, a dab at it? Maybe uh, on, on this question, I just want to say another element is, um, I think that we still have in Africa official development assistance, which is, you know, still quite important, you know, in terms of contributing to uh, transformation. And I think this is where it can play a role in de-risking the environment for, uh, for public, for private sector and creating better conditions and policy uh, conditions for, for this partnership to grow. So I would bring in beyond the intergovernmental organizations also the development partners who uh, still make significant contributions to the economy of the countries. And I would say to young entrepreneurs, get there first. You know, if you are the first on the scene with a solution, public sector, you get their attention. And I will use the example of Mpesa in, uh, in Kenya. At the time that started to come up, there was a gap and the public sector didn't really have the, the answer, didn't have the solution. And they very quietly, you know, the private sector that was doing it, quietly entered, penetrated the entire community and public sector had no other option but to partner with this incredible initiative. So your challenge today as young entrepreneurs, as young innovators, is to occupy the space first and then you will get the attention of public sector. That is fantastic. So I'd like to go to the audience and see if there's anyone who has a question. Can we have a microphone there, please? Good afternoon. Um, 
I'm Philippe from DRC. I will speak in French because I'm francophone. Uh, je, je suis Philippe de la RDC. Um, je suis jeune entreprise au Congo uh, qui est vrai dans l'agriculture comme uh, la dame ici, Néné Sissé, je crois. Nous aussi, nous, nous cultivons et nous transformons des fruits parce que notre entreprise s'est dit hein, c'est nous qui hein, l'Afrique sera développée si on cultive aussi sa terre. Si parce que on ne peut pas toujours se baser dans l'informatique, mais si on cultive la terre africaine, elle sera aussi beaucoup plus développée. Alors, ma question, euh, je, vais la, je vais la poser à M. Ali Bou, je crois, c'est ça l'entreprise, euh, et à Mme de la PNUD, du PNUD, pardon. Alors, je, je me dis, j'ai mon entreprise qui contribue aux ZDD, par exemple, comme ici je vois, Climate Action, et dans, un, dans une situation de guerre où j'avais planté par exemple 30 hectares de cacao et il y a guerre qui arrive dans ces milliers, comme chez nous des fois il y a guerre, oui. Et on arrive à ravager tout. Dois-je quitter les pays comme vous avez fait et me réfugier ou bien fuir et ne jamais re retourner Or, mon entreprise aidait la population tant soit peu et ça aide aussi aux ZDD parce que on dit que la plate contribue aussi à absorber les dioxydes de carbone. Alors, dans ces cas-là, je dois fuir ou bien euh, faire un repli stratégique. Alors, pour, euh, pour la maman des PNID, dans ces cas où on a tout ravagé, et je voudrais rattraper mes jeux plus de fonds, est-ce que le PNID peut m'aider pour euh, contribuer encore à, ces, à cette action d'élite euh, contre le réchauffement climatique euh, je voudrais répondre à sa, à sa question en français, vu que tu l'as posé en français. Donc la question c'est, si, si le pays euh, tourne mal, est-ce que tu restes, tu deviens patriote, tu meurs et pourris avec le pays ou tu sauves ta vie Alors ma réponse est très simple. Comme euh, la demoiselle l'a dit, l'environnement est très primordial, l'environnement dans lequel toi tu évolues. Je ne sais pas si tu étais au courant, mais le père de Steve Jobs était syrien. Il a fouillé la guerre en Syrie. Alors, euh, je te retourne la question. Crois-tu que si le père de Steve Jobs l'avait eu en Syrie, à Damas ou quelque part là-bas, en ce moment, on connaîtrait Apple, Macintosh et tous les trucs que tu voudrais acheter de, qui, qui sont le produit de, de Steve Jobs Est-ce qu'on connaîtrait les, les iPhones Personnellement, je ne crois pas. Donc, quelque part, toi, ta responsabilité, en tant qu'entrepreneur, c'est d'aller là où les idées sont le, les, plus, les plus rentables, les plus profitables. Ça, tu ne gagnes rien à rester quelque part où c'est la guerre, où tu souffres. Ça ne te rapporte rien. Ce n'est pas rentable. Et même, ça servirait à quoi si, donc je répète encore une fois, le père de Steve Jobs était resté en Syrie. Il serait mort, probablement où ils l'auraient eu et ils auraient été malades, et encore une fois, ça aurait, ça aurait apporté quoi à leur famille et au monde entier de rester dans la galère. Donc, il n'y a pas de vertu à rester pauvre. Il n'y a aucune vertu dans ça. Et en plus, on dit l'Afrique, c'est riche, l'Afrique a du potentiel. Pourquoi rester là où on est en train de tuer notre potentiel Autant aller avec les autres qui sont en train de l'exploiter. Donc, c'est ça ma réponse. So, so basically, he asked, um, he was asking Reynolds as, um, as a refugee in, in Africa, several countries go through war and sometimes if you have a company or you're doing, especially he was, he had like 30, 30 hectares de, de coco, he had like 30 hectares of coco and, and they were just, um, the war just ravaged them. So, What does he do? Does he become a refugee or stay in the country to continue providing job, try and provide jobs there at the minimum or become a refugee um, and then try to also set up somewhere else? So uh, Reynolds was saying, explore as much as you can wherever there's more opportunity. But also she, he was asking uh, in that case in a, in a war, in a war like that, uh, what is, UNDP doing to support initiatives like them to really get back up 
again. And I'll follow up with another question on, uh, that is right there on Slido that is talking about if you have innovation and solutions that are addressing SDGs, what kind of funds and financing facilities um, are set up to, to support those initiatives? I, I, first of all, I think Ronald's response, I think, is the most appropriate one because he's speaking from uh, experience there for, for you. In terms of UNDP's support um, in, in situations like this, actually in the Democratic Republic of Congo, UNDP and other UN agencies support stabilization uh, programs uh, where we mobilize resources that would help to uh, stabilize communities that have been disrupted, whose livelihoods have been disrupted as a result of uh, conflict, and where peace returns to those communities and people are able to go back, that we have uh, the support that is necessary. So this is, this is really uh, picking up steam, uh, what we call stabilization funds. Before we used to call it recovery initiatives, but now we have several uh, donors who are also investing in this, the European Union, for instance, um, and others. We have such a fund now being developed for the Sahel region, uh, where we've got also a lot of devastation, as well as the Lake Chad region, because of the uh, terrorism uh, attacks. So these uh, stabilization initiatives uh, are intended to help people come back to normal uh, livelihoods and restore back uh, and even build back better uh, from, from where they were. But it's never enough, I have to say. I mean, I think our general experience is there isn't enough investment in this compared to investment in handouts to, you know, clean up the emergency, to, to, to have an emergency response. And we continue to push uh, for, for policies that allow us to bridge that gap between an emergency response and stabilization of communities. Um, in terms of what uh, solutions, financial facilities, UNDP, for instance, is creating what we call accelerator SDG labs, uh, which will uh, have initial seed money for countries to experiment on solutions, you know, finding solutions to the very tough uh, development challenges that they face. So you will find more and more of these types of investments. The Danish government, for instance, is uh, funding an accelerator, uh, SDG accelerator program that also focuses on some of this. Again, not enough, but we're starting to uh, create joint funds, facilities that uh, the bold and the courageous can tap into because you have to be prepared to take risks. You have to be prepared to do bold initiatives to be able to be eligible for such funds. Thank you. So I think we'll take two more questions and then close. Um, the lady there, there's a young lady there. And then the last question is going to come somewhere here, so you choose who gets the last question. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm Mariam Dahir, I'm a medical doctor from Northwest Somalia, where they call Somaliland. Um, I, am, I think I'm fan of SDGs, I really love it, and because I born when, were not born, but I was aware of Millennial Development Goals and how Somalia suffer to achieve maternal death and to reduce maternal death. So that's one of the goals that we had last time and we were not achieving at all. So when I got the SDGs, I found every goal is linked to another. So if I'm working, I'm, I'm, I'm the chairperson of the Youth and FGM Somaliland, and I had critical working on, on an SDG 5, then I have to work on SDG 4, 3, then educating girls, so everything is connected. So what I found is like educating people because not, you can't only run with one goal, you have to do all the SDGs. So I'm asking, is there any ways that we found, we get uh, like 5.3, um, 5.9, 5 6.0, all of them together and then see this is for youth, this is for FGM, 
female genital mutilation, who doesn't know? This is for health that we have to educate mothers. We have to educate girls to be and healthy and to seek help. And all that crosses each other, especially bees as well. And then to create peace and all of that. So I'm asking, is there any way that we can somehow put things together? Because now we're educating SDGs more, but everybody is just running one with one and leaving the other, while the other one has a lot to do with the other one. Thank you. So before we answer, we can get the last question. Thank you. I'm Mr. Besson. I'm from Togo. You know, Togo is uh, between Ghana and Beni. Uh, you are French people there, so I will ask you to allow me going uh, or continue with French. Thank you. Um, en suivant uh, le le panel, uh, je voulais contribuer en tant que spécialiste de renforcement uh, des capacités des jeunes. Euh, sur euh, le, la contribution de la jeunesse. Si on parle des talents, la jeunesse africaine possède des talents. Nous avons des talents. Je n'en doute pas en voyant l'expérience que nos collègues viennent de partager. Nous avons des talents. Et si on ne veut pas de l'intelligence, nous sommes tous ici intelligents. Je vois des gens, des jeunes très intelligents ici. De l'éducation, de l'innovation, ça vient de l'Afrique. Euh, si... On, va, on nous demande comment est-ce que nous allons contribuer. J'ai pu mentionner ici qu'il s'agirait de la détermination, parce que j'ai vu dans le partage d'expérience de chacun la détermination. Et donc, comment est-ce que moi je détermine ou je, je définis la détermination Selon moi, la détermination, ça serait pour chaque jeune ici présent, euh, cette capacité que nous aurons à avoir, la passion pour notre Afrique, la passion. Euh, la passion pour porter dans le cœur euh, le, le souci de développement durable et de contribuer. Également, euh, nous allons travailler sur la persistance. Et donc, lorsque nous associons la passion et la persistance, je crois que nous aurons la détermination. Et seule la détermination fera que notre innovation, les talents que nous possédons, euh, toute cette, 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 l'intelligence que nous avons ici en Afrique, fera que nous serons un pays émergent. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. So in, he just contributed in saying, as young people, if we are determined, especially having a passion for developing Africa, as well as, um, what is, is it, and as well as being persistent and really working very hard to achieve, then we shall achieve the goals that, um, that we are setting ourselves towards, especially seeing that we have the talent uh, that we need to achieve so. So I think we'll answer um, the question um, about um, making sure that we work towards having, um, she was asking about um, if we have different SDGs and everyone is working in silos one by one without linking them, what happens? So I'll let you. Yeah, um, I'll start to answer the question from Mariam, uh, from my home country. Um, the beauty of the SDGs is the interlinkage that she talked about. Um, and, and it's not just one goal, but everything is like, and, and maternal mortality is a good example. I think as she has explained, um, you have to address not just health, but education, gender issues, gender inequalities as a major contributor to, to maternal mortality. Um, and it's the responsibility of everyone then. I just, one cannot say that I'm focusing only on this goal and not the other goals. Um, and the beauty of the partnership, which is goal 17, is that. So, so the education sector, the health sector, the people that work on gender, they need to work together in order to achieve the maternal mortality goal. Uh, let me end by uh, the point that the colleague from Togo has also mentioned. Um, in Generation Unlimited, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, good things on the platform is that we're going to build a knowledge sharing platform where um, the entrepreneurs that we have seen today are able to share their experience with others, other parts in Africa. 
Thank you. So let me conclude this panel by asking our panelists um, to tell me in one word, um, by when we get to 2030, what is that one thing you're excited to see in relation to the SDGs? So let me start with. Um, <clears throat> en 2030, c'est ça? Uh, premièrement, uh, l'autosuffisance alimentaire. Parce qu'on a beau vouloir réaliser des choses, mais quand le ventre est vide, c'est difficile de travailler. Ensuite, euh, une bonne éducation et également euh, un bon niveau de vie, donc euh, de bons salaires, un bon traitement. Euh, mais la première chose que je souhaiterais voir, ce serait d'abord euh, l'autosuffisance alimentaire. What I would wish to see by 2030 is that everyone here has a kind of project or a dream they want to, to do. And they come in workshop, in seminars, in summit. And the whole thing is, you can talk about your project, you can think about it, you can take note, you can attend um, conferences, but as long as you don't start by 2030, you will not achieve it. So the whole thing is, learn to start small, accept to be average for a time, then grow. So my, my wish is maybe today they can be inspired to, to start today. Not only think and get restrained to what they want to do. Like just start and see later what happens. Okay, so you said one word. I think my one word is transformation. So I would like to see a continent that is completely transformed in every single area and every single sector. And I believe that this transformation is going to be driven by the youth. And um, I challenge everybody here in this room, as I said before, choose an SDG, find a solution, and in 10 years, right? 10 years takes us to 2028, so we're gonna achieve what she's saying at 2030, two years early, if we start today. 2030, um, I wish to see Africa as the hub of innovation throughout the world. And innovation, not just technology, but innovation from every aspect. I think uh, what I really hope for, for 2030, is that no one will be left behind. Thank you to our panelists. I hope, I hope you were all inspired. And one thing I learned today is start today. Start today is the last word. And in 2030, we'll be here celebrating. Thank you all, and see you tomorrow. <laughs>